Today's episode is brought to you by our sponsoring partner, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. CBMA is a national membership network that's built a vibrant community of over 5,700 members and more than 2,700 organizations that's been working together over the past decade to build beloved communities across America where black men and boys are healthy, thriving, and enabled to achieve their fullest potential. If you're interested in learning more, hop on over right now to tbpod.com slash partners and consider joining the membership or donating to help them scale the impact of this growing field of black male achievement. You're listening to the trailblazers.fm podcast, where we'll explore the stories of today's successful black professionals, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Join us to access the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished professionals and come away with the know-how, confidence, and motivation you'll need to blaze your trail. And now here's your host, Stephen A. Hart. Merry Christmas, Blazer Nation. Hope you guys are enjoying this week. Hope you're able to take some time off to spend with a loved one, family, friend, or just relax and reboot in this last week of 2019, right? Uh, And getting ready for the new year. I thought about what we wanted to share this week. And, you know, last week I shared an inspirational episode titled Acres of Diamonds. It was a remix on an episode we had back on episode 15. And in last week's episode, I told you that you had all you needed, right? And that somewhere within the work you're doing today lurked an opportunity which could bring you everything you could possibly want for yourself, your family, your career, your business, right? And as I thought more about that, I wanted to follow up today with one of the best episodes we had this year. That was an example of that, right? Of someone tapping into their acres of diamonds. So I'm going to take you back to March of this year. And you're going to hear from one of my favorite all-time episodes on this podcast, with our friend and trailblazer, Mignon Francois of the Cupcake Collection, who absolutely found her acres of diamonds. If you hadn't yet done so, I also want to encourage you to join our Blazer Nation community. We just started a brand new group. It's exclusive. It's awesome. You get to connect and just fellowship, right? And vibe with other like-minded professionals, entrepreneurs, and leaders. You can find out more and join that group over at stevenahart.com slash Nation. Again, that's stevenahart.com forward slash blazonation. So let's not delay anymore, right? (laughs) Grab a pad and pen or open your favorite note-taking app and get set to receive today's motivational mission fuel or holiday mission fuel (laughs) from Mignon Francois. Happy holidays. Welcome and thank you for being our feature trailblazer today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Listen, at the time this episode goes live, we're in the middle of Women's History Month. And so I thought our Blazer Nation loves to hear our first question. We talk about gratitude on the podcast. And so I was hoping that maybe could have you share a woman or woman in your life that you're most grateful for. You know, besides saying something that is very, you know, common, like my mother, I mean, I can't do what I do without my mother. You know, I'm grateful for my daughters because they allow me to run my business in the way that I do. I'm grateful for my grandmother who kept her hand open and in her unselfishness taught me the things that I know. There are so many women in my village. My mother has a very small family and they died at a very early age. All of the matriarchs in my family died between 40 and 49. Wow. My mother is the eldest surviving member of her family. At 70, she is very elderly. Wow. For her. For a generation, yeah. um, We're so excited about that. So I'm very grateful for my mother. But if I was going to tell you about a woman that I was grateful for, I think my mother would even smile at hearing me remember a woman by the name of Mrs. Fishburn. Mrs. Fishburn, I don't know who she is to my life except for that she was a woman that knew my mother at the time when I was about five years old. And I'm getting emotional just thinking about the story to tell it to you. But I was about five years old. We had come home from church on a Saturday afternoon and my mother had burned the beans. 
that she was making for us. And it was all she had left. And Mm so the last of the beans that she could cook were hard and not ready for us to eat. And so we were complaining because we didn't want to eat any Mm -hmm. red beans. And she had cornbread and that's all she had. She had just been paid the day before and she had gone to church and she was struggling with God. Do I pay my tithe? Because Mm -hmm. if I don't pay my tithe, Mm -hmm. then I have enough money to feed my kids. Or, you know, am I faithful to you and I pay my tithe? If she paid her tithe, she didn't even have enough bus fare to get us back from church. So she was going to need a ride home with her Mm -hmm. three kids back from church. And so she asked someone for a ride home. She paid her tithe and she went home believing God. Someone knocked on our door. Wow. And in this moment, I am having a moment right now because I'm having a full circle moment right now in this moment. God has been sending women to knock on the doors of my life. Mm. And I'll tell you about another one later on. But I almost want to pause and get up and go run around my house. <laughs> I'm telling you, I might run around mine with you. <laughs> <laughs> to praise God because wow. Oh my gosh. This, you got me like story. tearing up right now, like listening to you. Yeah, this story I never realized until just now how God did it again. But anyway, she knocked on the door. We were sitting at the table, and my mom invited her in. And she said, I've been trying to call you, but you never answered the phone. You know, and when she called, she realized our phone was disconnected. Mm. And so she said, so I decided if your phone was disconnected, you were over here with these three children. You know, I needed to check on you. So she came over. It was around Valentine's Day. And she said, I bought you a Valentine's Day card, but you know how I am. Please don't open it until I leave. And so my mother said, "Okay, but, you know, that mystery, she really wants to open up that card. And as soon as she left, my mother tore open that card and inside of the card was a check and two hundred dollars. And that was nineteen seventy eight or seventy nine. So for somebody to give you that much money, she -hmm. gave her cash and there was a check in there. And that two hundred dollars was enough for her to feed her family for the week. It was her tithe money. It was enough for her to get us back and forth to school and to work. And my mom, recently I was telling her about Mrs. Fishburn because I said, I want to be Mrs. Fishburn to other people for the rest of my life because I don't know who this woman is. I don't know why she's connected to my mother or why she had a heart for my mother or where she came from or where she ever went. Does she have any children? Was she ever married? All I know is her name. And I know forever in our family, if we ever say, I had a Mrs. Fishburne experience today, my siblings know what that means. And so forever, she has been a lighthouse in Mm -hmm. the trajectory of our lives because now I want to do for other people what Mrs. Fishburne did for us. My mother had to go back to work on Monday just to call and say thank you because she didn't even have a phone to pick up to use. And that lady sacrificed something, you know, in exchange for us. So if I could tell you about any woman that changed my life, it's a woman that I don't really even know, but my story will never be able to be told without Mm. her. It's so amazing how when we do what God says to do, he is responsible for the outcome. And the thing is, is that God says, test me and see if I will not open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough for you to receive. And so it's like God said, "Okay, try me then, you know, and so she tried God and God showed up and her faith. My mother has been faithful over her tithe for all of our lives ever since. I'm looking at this week and I'm like just processing this for the first time. Like that happened on Saturday. Uh Friday was our third anniversary. And I've Mm -hmm. just been getting a lot of comments back about the podcast since last Friday. But since Sunday, so much has opened up. So much has opened up because we ended up being featured on Apple this Uh Sunday night. And this week has just opened up so much blessings. But I tell you what, you know, this is way off tangent, right? But no, just, like, I am, look, I am look, so grateful look. to you for sharing this story because, you know, God is amazing if you'd be obedient. Yes. Right. And the thing about it is, is this is what I tell people all the time. Keep your hand open. 
Mm. Yes, stuff is going to fall out. But when you lose things, you also leave your hand open to receive from God. You can't receive when you're tight fisted. Right. Like you can keep only what you can hold in your hand. That's all you get to keep. There's a story. God told me that he was going to bless me. I was standing in the shower one day and I heard, I heard this voice on the inside of me say, look at the water coming out of the shower head. So I'm looking at the water coming out of the shower head and say, count the drops. Mm. <laughs> Impossible impossible to count drops that are streaming from a shower head. And so I heard God say, catch the water in your hands and hold on to it. And so I clasp my hands and I'm trying to catch the water. And no matter how I hold it and then, you know, pull it over and try to keep it, you can only hold so much for a certain amount of time and it's going to seep through. And God said to me, these are my blessings. There's so many, you can't even count them but they're not yours to keep. Mm. You're only supposed to hold them for a little while. You're supposed to let them pass through you and fall onto someone else. But all you get to keep is whatever you can fit in your hand. And so when I learned to keep my hand open, God is blessing me with so many things. I heard someone say once, what if we're just hairs on the arm of God? Like Mm. this is about us. But what if our entire existence is that we are hairs on the arm of God? Like we think we're so much and that we're so big and we don't realize how little we are and how little our problems are and our situations, our circumstances. And we have such a big God that can handle them. And we're worried about what we're going to eat and what we're going to drink. And he cares for birds who don't toil for anything. Mm hmm. It's just like just sitting here talking to you and be able to share to everybody who's going to listen about what they can do if they just believe. And then to understand that something is required of you. Yes. Adam and Eve, if you believe in Christianity Mm -hmm. and if you believe in the narrative of the Bible, Adam and Eve in all of their glory probably had the best accommodations of all time. Like, <laughs> no matter what you try to create as an edifice, will you ever be able to create what Adam and Eve had? Mm. Think of the landscape. You know, mm. we get all excited about, you know, English gardens and, you know, beautiful <laughs> and the lighting on that house. You know what I mean? And you could probably never, ever even imagine or think about the digs that Adam and Eve had. And guess what? When God blessed them with the garden, what do he say? Work. Mm. <laughs> you know why? Because work is required of you. And we want to sit around and think that stuff is supposed to fall in our hands and we don't have to do anything to go and get it. If Adam had to work, then so do I. Yeah. And the harder that I'm willing to work for what it is that he's willing to give me, the more he's going to bless. Because work is required of us. Wow. Mignon, listen. (laughs) Listen, this is the longest grateful question I've ever had. (laughs) And I I don't even want to stop you. (laughs) I'm grateful. I live with a grateful heart, you know, so that's like. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. That's why I was so excited about asking that question. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Listen, I'm trying to understand your roots. And by the way, this is the first time for those listening. This is our first time meeting like five minutes before this conversation. So I'm getting to know you in this conversation like everyone else, but trying to understand your roots. You're in Nashville. Yes. Yeah. Is your roots New Orleans? Yes. Is that where you're born and raised? I was raised in New Orleans. I was born in Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Um, Kansas. Yes. To a military father and mother. And so we moved back to my father's hometown of New Orleans just around my first birthday. So all I know and understand truly about culture is New Orleans. So that's where I was raised. That's where my father was born. That's where our family is from. And that's where my heritage is. Yeah. Yeah. That's home. Mm -hmm. Growing up, did you have a love for food and baking? 
I did not. That's such a great question. I didn't know how to bake, not even out of a box when I, (laughs) but it's just a testament to every stupid thing that you've had to do in your life is preparing to take you from where you are to where you're called to be. I believe that. And I wanted to be a doctor. Really? I wanted to be a specialist. I wanted to be a neonatologist, probably because that's all I knew. Like in my community, if you wanted to get out, like if you wanted to elevate, that wow. if you wanted to be successful, you had to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a teacher. Mm. So that's what was acceptable to say, right? And so I went on to college, you know, I went to Xavier University to study. I had a scholarship and I went on to study biology. And I couldn't apply the science. No matter how hard I would study, I could not apply the science to the human body. And at that time, Xavier was the number one school for placing Black students into medical school. And so they were very adamant about helping you and, you know, holding up and getting you through. And I would be in professor's hours, you know, trying to get this chemistry and trying to learn this thing. And I could not get it. But 17 years later, standing in the back of my home in a kitchen when we were hungry and I was listening to a financial guru named Dave Ramsey, who was teaching people the biblical principles of financial freedom. Mm -hmm. And I was hearing people scream, we're debt free. And I wanted that. And so I was following that podcast. He was saying, have a bake sale. And I always had really big ideas. I mean, I felt like when I was a little girl that I was going to be famous. And my mom would be like, what you going to be famous for? I'm like, I don't know. She's like, well, be famous, baby. I mean, she was a cheerleader for whatever we came up with. Yes. And I just believed that God didn't waste this fabulous name on nobody knowing it. And so I had the (laughs) to make my name great. Mm -hmm. And so here I was 17 years later with this big idea that, (gasps) I could have a bake sale every day (laughs) and I could not only get out of debt, but I could build well, but I didn't know how to bake. But what I did have was two daughters, 10 and 16, who could. And I thought what I'll do, because my oldest daughter didn't have a plan for what she was going to do after high school. This would be my plan for her because she was getting ready to graduate from high school. And this would be my plan for her. And they would bake at night when they came home from school. And then I would sell it in the middle of the day out of the little window on our porch in the neighborhood where we were living. And shortly after I presented the idea to them and I got a little three by three sign printed to go outside of our house. It said bakery coming soon. My oldest daughter let me know she actually did have a plan and it did not include me (laughs) that she was going back to New Orleans. And so she was going home, you know, and So without her, my baby daughter was no longer interested. Mm -hmm. So here I am. I got to learn how to bake because I've told the whole entire world that I'm going to have a bakery because I put this three by three sign outside and I do what I, you know, I want to be about what I say I'm going to do. And this man is on the radio saying you could be debt free. And that was something that my mother instilled in her children was, you know, fiscal responsibility. And so I was trying to get to that. So I was married at the time and I went to my husband and I said, Hey, what can I do? And he said, you got books in there. Cause he had studied culinary. He's like, go read my books. I wanted him to tell me, he said, no, if you're going to be serious about it, do it yourself. Really? And so he said, you need to find out why baking powder, why bake a soda, why sometimes not, why do you need salt? I said, fine. Don't challenge me, honey, because I will take the challenge and I will kill it, you know? And so I had a secret weapon, my grandmother. I had spent as a teenager a lot of time with my grandmother. My grandmother lived about two hours outside of New Orleans. And when I learned to drive, I loved her so much. I would get in the car on the weekends and go spend time with my grandmother and my favorite cousin. We would hang out for the weekend and my mom would let me drive the two hours back and forth. And so I spent a lot of time snapping beans with her and stuff like that. Well, when I get pregnant at 17, I'm hungry all the time. Side note, I'm everything statistically that says I'm not supposed to be here. Mm. You know, I'm a black girl from a, you know, broken family, you know, divorced parents and being raised in a, my father was there, you know, air quotes. I mean, he was always active in our lives, but he wasn't in the home, you know, and then I get pregnant at 17. So I'm hungry. My mom hates to cook. 
So she makes a deal with me because I hate to wash dishes. I'm the baby child left at home at this point. And she's like, look, if you cook, I'll wash your dishes. So I get on the phone with grandma. Grandma, I'm hungry. Grandma teaches me how to cook over the phone long distance. So this is before long distance is free. So my mom would give me five minutes. Yeah. She could afford five minutes, you know, not too much more than that to talk to grandma. So, grandma, okay, all right, gr- you know, we're hurrying through the recipe. It's child, call me back. Hang up the phone before you get in trouble, you know? And so she would hurry up <laughs> in really small increments, tell me the recipes, but I had spent a lot of time with her. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long upon the land that I'm giving you. And when he says that long upon the land, it could also mean well upon the land, right? And so because I had spent that time with my grandmother, I knew over the phone what she was saying to do because I'd seen it, right? So I was able to go and do it over the phone and I learned how to cook at 17 long distance. So fast forward 17 years when I need to call my grandma because I need to make a cake. My grandmother would be the kind of woman that the movie The Help was made about. Right, right, right. Where she had to leave her children at home to go take care of someone else's children. So she was a really great cook. And you could always stop by Aunt Jenny's house at any time and you will be fed. There will be a meal and there will be dessert. And my grandmother is known for her coconut cake and her strawberry cake. Mm. I was flabbergasted when I went to visit my grandmother on her 84th birthday the other day. And there was a store-bought carrot cake. And I was like, I am in town and I am replacing this cake (laughs) before I leave here, you know. In the name of Um, Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Amen, you know. So I called grandma and I said, grandma, I need to make a cake. And she's like, why, girl? You don't even like to be in the kitchen. Everybody knows you can't bake. And I said, because there's a man on the radio. He says, you can be debt free. She said, babe, let me tell you, open up your hand. Because my grandmother doesn't have recipes. But she said, open up your hand, put that much flour, squeeze your fingers together, put that much salt, put this much that, put that, measure that first line on your, on your pinky. I would take your index finger because yours is longer than mine. She knew my hands and I knew hers. And I made my first successful cake that I baked, her strawberry cake. But looking at what I had written down about what grandma said, there was no consistency. And if you're going to open up a business, the first thing you have to be is consistent. Because when you taste something, you know, grandma's off sometimes, you know, (laughs) grandma's cake wasn't quite that awesome this week, you know. And so but a business that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at everything that grandma told me to do. And I, built a system. oh my gosh, the light bulb went off. Mm-hmm. This is everything I was learning in chemistry. Mm. The stuff I couldn't apply to the human body. You could apply right it to here. food. Yes. <laughs> it's right here. Now I understand this, that this recipe was about balancing chemical equations. Wow. What a full circle moment. (laughs) Yes. And I screamed bloody murder. Yes, 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 yes. It was like everything I needed came to me in that moment. And I got a pencil and I started jotting down because I knew about bonds. In that moment, it all made sense to me that if you add this chemical... And that ingredient, you're going to get this reaction. I started doing chemical equations in my kitchen Mm. and having scientific experiments. And that's how I made my recipe. Listen, I love this. This is an interesting... Beyond this call, we need to have a chat. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, yes. Because my dad is your grandma. Really? And I'm actually trying to work on a recipe of his. And exactly what you say is something uh-huh. I've been working through. Because he, unlike your grandma, every last time, his hand is perfect. But he can't write down that recipe for nothing. Uh-huh. I'm working on it right now. Yes. Uh, because there's a product there that I know is our family legacy. I mean, and that's the key word, legacy. It is. You know, one of my favorite Bible parables is about a woman who was losing everything she had. Even her sons were being taken from her because her husband had died and he had left debt. So her children were going to be taken into slavery. 
And she went to the prophet and says to him, help me because my children are about to be taken. What can I do? He said, what do you have in your house? And I sat with that. He didn't say, I'm going to help you. He said, how are you going to help yourself? Mm -hmm. Tell me what you got. And then I'll tell you what you can do with that. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, what was she willing to go and look at inside of her wheelhouse to bring that could be usable, that she could work to get what she needed? Yeah. Yeah. And the first thing he said was, all right, that's all you got. Bring that and do this with it. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, Inyan, you go on. Let's continue <laughs> the story and transition, right? This idea and this revelation to you now spins off into the cupcake collection. Mm-hmm. Fill me in on that gap because I see this amazing marketing pitch line that you turn $5 into $5 million. Uh-huh. Fill me in on this story, because I, okay. I don't think you necessarily went to school for entrepreneurship and business, I did not. right? Nope. So how did this all transpire to this measure of for you to take an idea as someone who is not like known to be a baker uh-huh. <laughs> to start a business and grow it to this measure of success? Yeah. So let me correct that for you. Yeah. It's $5 to over 5 million cupcakes. 5 million cupcakes. Yes. Five million cupcakes. So it's over five million cupcakes sold. So Good you know. Lord. <laughs> right. So here is why I almost was in tears when I was telling you the Miss Fishburne story. I'm sitting in the back of my house and I'm following this Dave Ramsey baby steps plan where you take whatever money that you have and you put it in envelopes because when you're poor. I did FPU, so I'm with you. Okay, okay. So when you're poor, you can't afford to mess up one dollar in the bank mm-hmm. and then get a bank fee mm-hmm. of 35 or 70 or a hundred, you know what I mean? Because it can add up real fast, and then you have whatever little you had is gone. Yeah. So you can't even afford to have your money in the bank. You need to keep your money in cash mm-hmm. and it needs to stay with you. Yeah. So that you can feel it and you know you can make moves and not mess it up. So I was in the back of the house with the money that I had putting it in the envelope system. And I had paid all that I could pay and I didn't pay everything. And all I had was $5 left and I still hadn't fed the family. God, there are eight of us. What am I going to do with $5? So I'm from New Orleans. I knew I had rice. Come on now, rice. You're from the islands. Listen, I eat rice every day, my girl. (laughs) (laughs) You know what, right? You know, you yeah. can feed yourself on rice alone, right? All day long. Yeah, man. So we keep rice and bats, you know? Mm-hmm. So we had rice and I figured I could buy beans. That's what we're going to be eating. Watch this full circle. We're going to be eating beans and rice. Told you about beans Yeah. at five years old. Yeah. And now here we are. We're about to be eating beans. This full circle moment is revealing itself to me, even right now in this moment. You know what I'm oh saying? Oh, my like, gosh. I, I'm down to beans when somebody knocks on my door. And it's my neighbor across the street. Now, mind you, I'm sitting in the dark in my house when I answer the door because we're living on a generator and going every day to work to get cash money, to buy gas, to put in the generator that's hooked up to our house in order to give our children normalcy of some sort of semblance of electricity. I stay in the house in the dark or I go away from the house during the day so that I can reserve the gas for night when our children come home so they can feel like they have electricity. And my neighbor says to me, why are you sitting in the dark? And I said, because I'm meditating. Duh. And so she goes, well, I'll let you get back to what you're doing. But hey, those cupcakes that you've been making for the neighborhood, because what I had been doing is when they would tear down a house and put up a condo. Right. So it would be one house goes down and three houses go up. Mm-hmm. One house come down and five houses go up in its place. And when I would see a real estate agent, I would run out and say, hey, my name is Mignon. I live in this house right here. I got a bakery coming soon. I'm learning how to bake. My family says it's good. 
I want to make sure that they're not just telling me that because they love me. So I'm testing my product, my scientific theory right here. I'm testing it. What I learned in college 17 years before. They start testing my product. I said, look, will you taste it? They say yes. They start coming back and said, oh, my goodness, never had anything like this before. Knock, knock, knock on my door. Can I buy some of that? Mm. And so I started growing a reputation in the neighborhood because my house had been a crack house before I moved in it. So the, the people were calling it the lemon crack house. Now, mind you, there's so many pieces to my story. When we moved into this house, we moved into it. It was two rooms and a half bathroom. Half bath meaning a tub and a toilet. Mm. Two rooms mean plywood floor. Okay. That's all we had. Never did my children go to school and complain about anything. Tell anybody about eight people in two rooms. So here we are. The neighbors have begun to coin this place, the lemon crack house. And she says, I want to buy these lemon cupcakes for all of my clients. So as you bake them, I will pay you. Now she had about 600 people. What? I'm like, God, I only got $5. What am I to do? She wants. <laughs> you, you, what am I to do with this? I can't even start. I tell her, okay. I close the door and I start to talk to God and say, God, really? I mean, why would you send this to me when I have no money? God said, but I feed birds. But you look like me. And I just think about parents who look at their children and they admire them and they're beautiful and they're the most beautiful babies in the world to you. And what would you do for them, especially when you look at them and you see yourself? And that's what I felt like God was telling me. And God reminded me of the Bible verse that said, the lilies of the field and all of their splendor are here today and gone tomorrow. How much more am I going to take care of you? My cars had just been repossessed. I got my shoes on and I walked to the grocery store with my $5 and I took a gamble and I bought all the ingredients I could buy with that $5. And I came home, reared up the generator and I started baking cupcakes. I turned that five into 60 that day. I turned that 60 into 600 by the end of the week. And I've turned that into over $10 million in the time that my business has been in operation. I say that to say, Little becomes much when you place it in the master's hands. I am speechless. <laughs> that right there is a moment. Wow. I don't even know where I'm at in this episode. <laughs> and Jan, that right there is a word. That right there is a word. Good Lord. Oh, yeah do is listen to that little voice on the inside that's telling us that we can. Mm. You know, one of the things that I'm working really hard in my life, I learned from a pastor that I follow named Stephen Furtick. And he said no, um, his grandmother would, you know, they had a family thing that would say, you can't make a statement without following it with, and that's just the way I want it. Mm. So when we speak against ourselves and we tell ourselves that we can't do things, who is ourselves supposed to believe if we can't believe in us? Mm -hmm. So I've learned to check myself when I get ready to speak against myself. And even my team and my children will correct me. And I say something negative about myself. They'll say, oh, and that's just the way you want it. Man, you get on my nerves. Oh, and that's just the way I want it. You're driving me crazy. You want to be crazy? That's just the way you want it? So <laughs> We check what we want for ourselves by speaking what we seek till we see what we've said. Mm. If I want to have anything, I have to speak that thing into existence. I have to speak things that I cannot see as if they were so that they can come into fruition. Yes. I told yes. You beginning that I always knew that I was going to be famous. I just didn't know what for. So as I began to speak that thing, it began to be that I was known and that God allowed this platform because he knew that I would tell other people about him. 
And it doesn't even matter to me. And I don't even check the atmosphere to make sure he's welcome because I don't care because he comes with me. And if he can't come, then I don't come. Tonight, with this week, we had an episode <laughs> go live with Jay Morrison, mm-hmm. who is a brother that started a fund. And just about two hours ago, I read a comment on one of the posts about the episode. And a young lady said, I'd love to invest in your fund, but I don't have the money. And my reply to her comment was, do not speak that negativity into the world. Yeah. I said, not yet. Not yet. But you will have it. And Mm -hmm. you need to believe that you will have it to invest. Mm -hmm. And I'm in 100% agreement with you on that. You have to speak out to the world what you believe, what you want to see in yourself, right? And allow God to work his miracles and have his way, right? It's yeah, because you know, the Bible tells us that the power of life and death lie inside of your tongue. Because God says that the same power that I put into my son, I've given it to you. And so we have the same power. Again, if you believe in the narrative of the Bible, when Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, you're going to do greater things than I ever did. Yeah. yeah. So that means that we have power to make things happen. And so God says, anything that I send, I send it out with power. And it does not come back to me until it's done what I sent for it to do. And so if that same power is living on the inside of us and we believe, then we exercise that power to do what we send it out to do. So we can use it for negativity or we can use it for positivity. That's why when we speak what we seek, we will see what we've said. And whether you're seeking negativity or whether you're seeking positivity, you will get that. It's kind of like if you don't want to be religious and you're hearing this and you're like, I want to hear that in a real thing, then it's like, well, the glass is half empty or the glass is half full. Either way you see it, you're both are right. Yes. Listen, I, I'm going to print that phrase on a T-shirt and send it to you. <laughs> yeah. I love this woman. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Listen, I introduced you as the inspiring. What inspires you? Where's this joy and this fire? Where does it come from? Oh, my gosh. Hunger. Yo, for real. (laughs) Hunger is what inspired me. Literally, when you are hungry, you will do what it takes to eat. Yes. And when you are truly tired of being sick and tired, you will do something to change your situation. For me, I was sitting in that house and I heard Kanye West say, in a rap song, and I need to go find out which rap song this is because I quote it all the time, but he was talking about he was driving his other other bins. Mm. And I was like, wait a minute, God. Kanye got options mm. and they're luxurious. Mm. And I don't even have a car. Mm-hmm. That ain't right. <laughs> sick and tired of being sick and tired, you change. Yeah. It was like in that moment, I was like, God, It's not fair that everybody in this neighborhood has lights and I don't. I'm living in an affluent neighborhood surrounded by affluence and I don't have lights. And when my children turn on the faucet, water doesn't always come out. And that same store that I walked to to get ingredients to make cupcakes was the same store I was walking to to buy gallons of water to pour it in the tub and give the baby a bath first because that's what we could do. That's, you know, it's like that's the same neighborhood where we took a bucket and bought a toilet seat cover to sit it on a bucket so that we could have an extra toilet with eight people. Wow. In 2005, Mm -hmm. six, seven, eight, nine. We're not talking about 1940, 30, 20, anything. Yeah. This is right here in this millennium where everybody listening is able to put their point on where they were and what they were doing. Mm -hmm. This is not so far away that you can't touch it. And so that was the driving force for me. I believed that if they could have the bare necessities that were luxuries to me, 
then I deserve to have it too. But the difference is I learned that it was based on my work. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Christians have heard that over and over again. But one day I was reading this Bible verse a couple of years ago and I realized, so I ended up getting my degree in journalism and communications after 10 years of struggling, I get my degree, right? So I understand punctuation and grammar. And I'm looking at this Bible verse and I realize there's a comma. I'm just sitting here staring at this Bible verse. And I realize there's a comma after faith, which tells me that these two words now in faith are separated from the rest of the, the text. That means they go together. Anything before the comma goes together in English. Mm. So this is not just faith. This is now faith. Mm. Now, we have faith to believe in things based on what we've seen it do. So you will put your key in your car and you have faith to believe that it will start and it will take you where it's going because you know certain things about that car. And you know how that car breaks down. You just jug this little wire to the right a little bit. It's going to start up because you have faith to believe it because you've seen it work. But there is a difference between faith that has something to base the experience on and now faith. Mm -hmm. Now faith moves without any evidence. Now faith moves and acts when I haven't seen anything to believe that it will work. And the reason why now faith taps into the heart of God and makes him open up windows for you is because when you exercise and you operate in now faith, you put yourself on the same playing field to give to God what he gave to you. God said, I emptied out heaven. I gave you my only son so that you can have life more abundantly. But if you look at the word abundant in the original form that the word was pinned in context, abundant means to the full. So I give you my only son. I empty out heaven for you so that you can live life to the full. And yet you sit and you, you're mediocre and you think that I should do something for you when you do nothing. And you live these mediocre lives and you want these grand blessings for mediocrity in exchange. But the reason why now faith taps into the heart of God is because of perspective. Look at it. Now, N-O-W is O-W-N. All you O-W-N is N-O-W. The moments that your listeners are sitting here to listen to this podcast right now is all that we own. As I'm sitting here talking with you, sirens are going off around me, warning of an imminent tornado in my area. And in the next few minutes, this house that I'm sitting in, the roof may be blown off. The walls may fall down. It may be flattened to the core. And what do I own? What I chose to do with the moment that I was sitting in how I chose to use my life to tell others about what they could do if they believe. All you O-W-N is right in O-W. And when you give all you O-W-N right in O-W, you will W-O-N. Good Lord, I'm going to run around this house right now. (laughs) Because you do what God did. You give your all to be obedient to the call of what he told you to do. You don't have to go and check it. You don't have to go and ask anybody. You don't have to have enough money. You don't have to have all the ingredients. You don't have to have all the right tools. You go right now in obedience, believing that it's going to manifest. When I opened up the cupcake collection, I opened it with a KitchenAid mixer and a dorm size refrigerator because that's what would pass code. Of course, I needed a commercial refrigerator. But not right now. Of course, I needed a commercial mixer, but not right now. Of course, I needed several bowls and containers to house my things and lots of boxes to put my product in. I went to the grocery store every single day and I bought what I needed right now. 
There were days when I would go to the store and buy it what ingredients I needed to open the store and then go back to the store with what I made while the store is still running to go buy more ingredients. Because as you move, God will meet you where you are and he'll be like, come on and catch up with me. He's always ahead of you. So that's why now faith is the substance of things that you hope for and why it's evidenced by the things you cannot see. And if people would understand that now faith is different, they would tap into the heart of God. And that's why I've been so successful, not because I deserve it, but because I was obedient. And God has to do what he promises. So you got to draw circles around what he says. Oh, no, 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 God. You said I am the head and not the tail. You said I'm above and not beneath. You said no good thing will you withhold from me. God, I am losing everything I have. I am hurting. I am sick. My husband left me and I am a stay-at-home mom. My true life story. What am I to do? The Bible says that all things, not some things, Not sometimes, not when you feel like it, not in the morning, not in the evening. All things, all the time, work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That means that no matter what it looks like, it's working for my good. No matter what I'm going through, it's working for my good. No matter what, no matter how I feel, it's working for my good. And that's why I've been successful. Wow. Wow. Listen. I love you. I love you, man. <laughs> I love. I'm literally sitting here like, how do I get through this interview without saying another word? Because I just want to <laughs> listen to you talk for the rest of the night. We are like an hour in and I need to push ahead. Do I want to continue for another one? As I listen to you talk, you shared the story about your daughters. And mm-hmm. I hear you going through this valley to come out to the next peak. Obviously, parenting is... I love to say parenting is the hardest job in the world with no prior work experience. Mm -hmm. You had to be scared in this season as a parent. We all are scared as parents anyway. Mm -hmm. What was your approach to parenting the girls through the season? What was your approach? Oh my goodness. I have always been the kind of mom that allowed my children to express themselves and I listened to them. The Bible tells us that a little child will lead them. And I always listened to them. If my children ever told me they didn't want to go to school because my children love to go to school, I wouldn't make them go to school. Really? If you want to stay home, then you stay home because I don't know what God is telling you. Mm. When it came down to them making career choices, like, well, what is God saying? You know, like my mother didn't want me. No, girl, there's no money in that. You need to do this. You need to do that. And it took me so long to find my calling because I was listening to my mother. And, you know, she was doing the best that she knew how. Right. But I believe that God can speak to children, too. And he tells them what he wants them to do. So I nurtured very early on them understanding how to hear God for themselves. So the way I parented them was we communicated everything. I remember when my daughter started liking boys and we were talking about sex and she just very transparently came and told me, you know, some stuff. And her girlfriend was spending the night and her mouth dropped to the floor. She said, you told your mother that? And my daughter goes, you don't tell yours? (laughs) (laughs) And so that's the way that I parented them. You know, it was an open conversation and they learned the obedience. They learned to listen to their spirit. They learned to follow it because parents, sometimes we think we know it all Mm -hmm. and we are messing up all along the way. And sometimes you got to listen to your children. They teach us. They teach us. We learn through them, right? (laughs) We learn through them in so many ways. Let me ask you, what's the message? Because, girl, you got some messages. (laughs) But at the end of the day, what's the core message that you try to impart to them as a legacy message? We're talking about legacy earlier. Mm -hmm. What's the legacy message to them that you hope that they impart to their own daughters in time? There is a story. The story of Queen Esther says that before you could go to the king, you had to have something to bring. So the ladies in waiting, per se, were 
kept for six months before they could be presented to the king, right? For beautification, you know, and all that kind of stuff and to prepare themselves to be presented before the king. So for me, when I read that story, why Queen Esther was chosen is because she prepared herself. Hmm. And that's the thing that I'm leaving for legacy for my daughters to understand that what we are in preparation for has nothing to do with us. Everything that we are doing has everything to do with the ones that are coming behind us. My children know that when I leave this life and close my eyes and forever sleep, I'm leaving them nothing because they had me here. And they had me while we were living to bounce things off of each other and to grow and to sow seeds and to water those seeds and to use my wisdom. Because I would always tell them, we're running a marathon. When I put that baton in your hand, you're not supposed to go back to the starting line and run the same race I ran. You're supposed to continue the race. So why would you go back and make the same mistakes that I made when I already made them for you? You're backtracking. And so what they know is that everything that I'm leaving is for my children's children, because the Bible tells me that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And so I want my children to know what my daughters do know that what we're preparing and what we're doing is leaving something for the ones that are coming behind us. We're dropping cupcake crumbs. (laughs) And we're leaving a trail that they'll be able to pick up and follow because my greatest desire is for my grandbabies to walk into a room and say, my grandmother was Mignon Francois, and I want that to matter for something. I love that. It will matter for something. And they'll have this word, the, the nuggets of wisdom, the gems that you've been dropping in this episode and in so many other pieces you shared. Oh, my gosh. Let me ask you, what are you reading right now? What books should we be tapping into? Okay, what am I? Beyond the Bible, because girl, (laughs) you know the word. (laughs) So we know you in your word. One of my favorite things, if I was going to tell anybody to get, I would tell them to get Audible. Mm -hmm. Because when you're trying to go somewhere and do something, you don't necessarily have time to sit down and read a book. But you can get the equivalent of a college degree in two years, the time that you take to commute from home to work every day. And let me add something to you, right? Add a nugget of wisdom. I don't know if you're familiar, but there are a couple of apps that are free uh-huh. that allow you to log in using a library card. Really? Overdrive is one. I haven't spoke about it in a while on a podcast for those people who are new as listeners. There are a couple apps. One is Overdrive. Another one is called Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. Okay. And you can log in to a library. Mm-hmm. There might be some other apps, but you can log into a local library through those apps and access the books in your libraries, uh-huh. Arsenal, wow. the audiobooks, or even their eBooks. Like you, I'm an audio guy. I'm a podcaster. Uh-huh. But you can log in and rent books for two weeks at a time for free. Wow. Audible is great. I use Audible. I use Apple Books. I buy books on Apple Books. I use Audible. I use Libby. I use Overdrive. But Mm -hmm. I can, like you touched on, I mean, I've listened to three or four books from the year started. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to encourage others. So I read a lot because I'm in my car a lot and I'm always listening. But one of the books that I actually turn the pages on is a book called Business Secrets from the Bible. And it's by Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Mm -hmm. And this thing, it says spiritual success strategies for financial abundance. And what it basically says is that Jewish people are rich for a reason. Mm -hmm. Because they follow the principles of the Bible. And so much of what I know about money is what I learned from this book. I carry it many places. Every time I have a plane to catch, you know, I'm taking it with me because there's so much wisdom in it. I like to tell everybody about it. The other book that I'm listening to right now. Girl, (laughs) listen, listen. That was my first, and it's a big book. It's a big yes. read. Yeah, yes. But I listened to that in audiobook. Uh-huh. I don't know if you've listened to the audiobook. I know yes. you have the, I love that she did the read on the uh-huh. audiobook. Michelle Obama, by the way, for everyone listening, you just held up Becoming by Michelle Obama. 
Amazing book. Mm-hmm. Amazing book. There's so much wisdom in that book. Like listening so to much. her story, her transparency, her. And don't you just love her voice? I mean. Oh my gosh. I mean, you love her. You know, she is. She Authenticity. Is yes. She oh, is oh my goodness. <laughs> she is our Jackie O, you know what I mean? I wonder, I, like, if even Barack was like, all right, that's maybe too much. <laughs> right? At times, I mean, she right. just got real in that book. So I love her book. so much. I love her. I love her because when I see her, I see what I can be. Yes. You know, and she could be our president, you know what I mean? And I love her for her transparency. And that's one of the things that when I was married, that my husband had problems with my transparency, Mm -hmm. you know? And I said, Hey, I got to tell people because people are hungry. They're hungry for authenticity. They're hungry for authentic relationships. People are tired of fake it till you make it. Everybody's being fake. And somebody needs to know that they're not alone. Somebody needs to know that, hey, I went through it too. So that when you go through it, you don't feel like it's only happening to you. And that's one of the things that I'm loving about this book is her willingness to tell you. So my mother got it for me for Christmas because I needed to actually turn these pages. Mm -hmm. I needed to touch these words and chew on them, you know, because it was just so much depth that I couldn't even listen to it. Audible, but I I was listening to it nonstop. I was at work. I was like, if you don't got nothing to touch me, you don't need me right now. Leave me alone and let me just be in peace. And I was, it took me a couple of weeks to get through the audio. Yeah. But it's such a good book. And as as a man with a strong wife and kids, I connected to so many sides of her journey. So, you know, it's a powerful book for women for obvious reasons, but Brothers need to be tuned into this book as well. Yeah. So the other thing that I'm reading, because like, you know, they say that readers are leaders. Yes. So one of the other books I just got gifted on yesterday because the owner of the Better Book Club heard me say that I wanted to read this book, dropped it off for me at my bakery and it's called Uncontainable. Mm. And it's the story of the container store. And I'm so, you know, just intrigued by the way that they operate their business and how they treat their employees and the philosophies that they use to create their business. And so I'm excited to crack that one open. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Love it. (laughs) Listen, last question of the night. Uh We ask all our featured trailblazers, what's one action that our Blazer Nation community should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Oh, my gosh. I thought about this question and I thought that I was going to say something different, but I think that the one thing that I want to tell them is to stop waiting and start doing. You will never have the perfect time. You will never have the right money. You will never have the right people on the team. You will never have the right clothes to wear. Some of the most successful people in this world have shoes that have holes on the bottom of it. Doesn't matter if your jeans have holes in between the legs. Nobody's going to see it. You start where you are to get to where you want to be. Because if you don't, you don't get to be mad when you see somebody else doing what it is that you want to do. You know, I love to use this scenario. An egg is just loaded potential. That's all an egg is. It's a bunch of loaded potential. But if you don't break that egg, it's going to rot in all of its potential. An egg has to first become broken before you can use it. So you don't get to sit in your brokenness and say, oh, poor me, look what happened to me and what somebody did to you and all of that kind of stuff because what happened to you actually happened for you because you couldn't be used until you became broken. Otherwise, you would sit in all of your potential and rot. But it was when you became broken that you could truly be used and all of your potential could be manifested once you became broken. So that's my advice for people is to start right now 
pick up a pen and start writing the book on the piece of paper that's sitting on your nightstand. Get up right now and go pull the dishes out of the cabinet and make the cake and take it to work tomorrow and let the people taste it and then let them place orders. Let them pay you in advance for the orders they want to place so you can go and buy the ingredients to make what it is that you need to get. Start right now by taking pictures on Instagram of the organization of your closet so you can go organize somebody else's that takes you no money. I mean, it's just so many things that we can do right now. Go help the neighbor's children next door with your idea of how you can teach kids to read because you have this wonderful, amazing plan of how you're going to change them through education. These things cost you nothing but your now. And that's what I want people to know. Mignon, Francois, this has been the most amazing episode. And I am like so ready right now to hit stuff <laughs> and share the episode tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you left me with a word and I am so encouraged by you. Before I forget, because I'm giddy now with your words in my head. Tell us how we can stay connected to you. Oh my gosh, so awesome. You can get me on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. I think we're even on, what didn't I mention? I think we're even on Snapchat. But on Instagram, I am mignon.francois. Or you can get me at the Cupcake Collection on Instagram and Facebook. And then on Twitter at Cupcake Tweets. Or our website, thecupcakecollection.com. And I'll be sure to post all those links to your social and your website over on our show notes page at tbpod.com. Listen, I am blessed by you. I acknowledge you for the work you're doing with the Cupcake Collection. But more importantly, I acknowledge you for listening to God's calling because we each have a talent. Somebody recently, I feel like on the podcast, said to me recently that God didn't give anybody else instruction to build an ark told mm-hmm. no right and we each have a talent we each have a calling mm-hmm. and your gift right now you know is one of your gifts came through the cupcake collection but you have a gift to speak into lives thank you and you spoke into my life and you spoke into the thousands of people that will listen to this episode Amen. Um, without question and i acknowledge you for that and i encourage you to continue this Thank work, you. this side, because this is a passion play for you and Thank you have you. a heart for it and you have a heart for God. And I feel that energy tonight and you've encouraged me beyond what you will even begin to understand. So thank you so very much. Bless the Lord. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to keep my promise to him that if he would make me successful, I would tell anybody about what they could do if they believe. So thank you so much for allowing me to spend some of my faith currency here with your listeners. I'm Steve Nehart, and you've been listening to the Trailblazers.fm podcast. If you're not yet doing so, consider following Trailblazers.fm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and feel free to connect with me over on LinkedIn. Whenever you're posting stories or social media posts about Trailblazers.fm, be sure to use the hashtag TBPod and hashtag Mission Fuel. We'll be able to see you and I'll be able to show some love. And in case you're not aware, our show notes for all our episodes can be found on our website over at TBPod.com. Now, if today was your first time listening, I just want to say big ups, enough respect for checking us out. You've made this Jamaican guy really happy that you're here with us today. And I'd love your help with keeping this black excellence flowing each and every week. So if you haven't yet subscribed, hop on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Search trailblazers.fm and subscribe, rate, and review us there. Be sure to browse through some of our past episodes. There are more than 150 published episodes now. And a little something is out there for everyone to help keep the knowledge flowing. We grow when you, as part of our Blazer Nation community, shares and invites your friends and family to listen to an episode you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories are going to be moved to make significant changes that have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. 
Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. Blaze the Nation, go out today and find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. <laughs> <laughs>